Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the State of the University Address of William Peace University. It is great to welcome you all here today. Um, before we get started, as many of you know, we lost a treasured member of our community in this past week. And um, I would like to just uh, open with a moment of silence in remembrance of Dr. Carol Hisco, if we could, please. Thank you. Uh, for those of you that are not aware, there's a wonderful obituary in the uh, News Observer. There's also a story on our website with details about the upcoming service uh, later this week at Duke Chapel at 2.30 on Thursday. And then there's going to be a gathering across the street at Holy Trinity from 6 to 8. And we're also working with a family to have an event here on campus a little bit later this semester. So let's talk a little bit about William Peace University and where we're headed. I first and foremost want to extend my greetings to our faculty and staff, as well as members of our Student Government Association who are down here in front like good students. <laughs> I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to many of the special guests that we have here today. We have members, uh, both current and former members of our Board of Trustees, as well as our Foundation Board. We have a number of alumni and friends and fans of the university are here today. And we are especially fortunate to have one of our former presidents, Dr. Garrett Briggs, along with his wonderful wife, Susan, here. Um, if I could, could you mind standing just so we could recognize you? And lastly, I also want to extend a special welcome to my beautiful bride, Kristen, who's joined us here today as well. So today's going to be an update about all the great things that are happening at William Peace University. We're going to have an opportunity to have some questions at the end. Uh, many of you are aware that we put out a call for questions in advance, and so uh, several of you had submitted questions before today, and so I'll be hitting those first, and then we'll also have some additional questions that'll come from the audience. And uh, for those of you who are social media um, experts, we also are providing opportunity for you to send in some uh, through Twitter. So hopefully we'll get a few of you. So if you see some people with their phones up, hopefully they're not texting and they're simply uh, submitting some outstanding questions along the way. Uh, one of my mentors often says that the quality of an institution will never exceed the quality of the people in it. And I couldn't agree more. And I first and foremost want to update you with a f simple fact that I'm just thrilled to be a part of this community and to partnering with our faculty and staff to move this institution forward. It is a tremendous group of people who are all focused on elevating the work that we do every day. And so I first and foremost want to extend my thanks to the faculty and staff. I also believe personally that an institution is never going to exceed the quality of its leadership team. And so one of the first updates that I want to share with you is that I'm thrilled to report that William Peace University now has a complete, uh-oh. I know that the anticipation is just absolutely, uh, we tested this twice earlier. All right. So could we advance the slide there and we'll try to tech. So um, if you can go one more, please. Great. So I'm sure the anticipation was exciting. Um, so um, really fortunate. This is our leadership team here at the university, comprised of all of our, of our vice presidents here. And it's a relatively new team. Charlie on the far left. Um, Dr. Duncan has been here 18 years, but uh, only in his current role uh, since May of this year. Next to him is Dr. Chris Cohen, who uh, started here also in May as our vice president for enrollment management and marketing. Thank you, Abby. Um, Jody Steamy Peeler also just started with the team this year, and that was on August 1st of this year. Mr. Frank Rizzo is our Vice President for Student Life. Thank you. And uh, he's been here, uh, for, he's in his fourth year, and then Mr. Rocky Yearwood, our Vice President for Administration and CFO, is in his fifth year. And I'm absolutely thrilled with the work that this team is doing. They've been working hard, and uh, I'd just like to invite them to stand up if they would, just so everybody can recognize them. One of the, my favorite parts of this slide, of course, is that they're all smiling. And um, the good news is, is now that we have a complete leadership team, I'm taking a month off. Uh, and maybe that's why they're smiling. Uh, 
So let's talk a little bit about where we are today. Um, I thought it'd be helpful for many of you to have an understanding of uh, where we currently sit so that as we talk about where we're heading later on today, you'll have a little bit of a framework from which to operate. Uh, when we opened this fall, we had a, a peak enrollment of 1,044 students. So when people on the street ask you, how big is William Peace? I'm all about rounding up, so you can say 1,050. And um, that's comprised of 810 traditional, or also known as day students. And then we also have 234 students enrolled in our School of Professional Studies. For those of you that are not familiar, many of you may be familiar with our historical reference to the traditional age population, but we also have a vibrant adult um, program for uh, folks who have either um, started their degrees and not finished them, or maybe for whatever reason had to postpone going to college and are starting a little bit later in life. And the SPS program is a great program for them to do that. And as I mentioned, we have 234 students in that program. That program is exclusively online at night or on weekends. We have 21 states represented on our campus this fall, and we're just shy of 500 total residential students. We have 316 residential students here at 15 East P Street, and we master lease two buildings out at the V at Raleigh, which is just past North Carolina State University, where we currently have 182 residents. Um, that structure is a little bit different in the sense that we have uh, full-time professional staff who live out at the V who partner with our students um, in that living environment. So it's a really great environment for our students. We also have the largest number of student athletes on our campus this fall in the history of the institution with currently at 187 students on our rosters. A little bit about the university in general, we have 21 acres here on our main campus and then next door at Seaboard, which we also own is an additional nine acres. We have 16 buildings here at 15 East Peace Street. This fall, we have 30 full-time faculty members and 82 adjunct faculty members. Uh, two of those full-time, by the way, are three-quarter time. We have 74 full-time staff this year and 19 part-time staff. Our budget for this year is $21.2 million, and our endowment valued as of June 30th was $35.5 million. Uh, first thing I wanted to talk to you about as we're talking about our future is a little bit about where we currently are, and that's the bridge plan. Now, some of you are very familiar with the bridge plan. Others, this is the first time that you're hearing about it. The bridge plan was a plan that we developed starting last fall that was designed to do a couple things. First and foremost is to put into action some very specific tactical steps under key areas that the institution could focus on over about a 20, 18 to 24 month period. It's designed to come to fruition in its totality in this coming May, May 7, 2017. It's focused on four key pillars, fostering enrollment growth, connecting with our alumni and friends, strengthening academics, and optimizing our resources. And as I mentioned, all of those are really supposed to come to fruition by this May. The purpose of the bridge plan was, as I mentioned, first and foremost, to focus the institution on a couple key areas. The second purpose of the bridge plan was to buy us time while we kept moving forward to undertake a longer term strategic plan. And we're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. What, we've, what I'm really excited to report is that we've had a lot of success with the bridge plan, and that's through a lot of efforts of many people in this room. I'm gonna provide just a couple key highlights, maybe. All right, if we could event now, there we go. So uh, the first highlight is in enrollment growth. Uh, one of the first things I always like to talk about in enrollment is just not about attracting new students. So it's also about making sure that we're keeping the students that we have and helping them be successful. And one of the things I'm most proud of, in just one year, we had a tremendous impact on our student retention. Retention is the phrase that's used measuring the number of students who enroll as first year students and then come back as second year students. It's often referred to as a first year retention rate and we had a 10 percentage point increase in our retention this year. Now, do we have room for more? Absolutely, but that kind of jump is really extraordinary, and that's through the efforts of a lot of people in this room, in particular the, the staff from our Center for Student Success and a lot of the faculty and advising staff who worked really, really hard this year to work with our students more closely and help, help to make sure that they were successful. Our overall traditional or day enrollment is up slightly this year, very, very slightly, um, but it is up, and as a former enrollment leader, up is up. Um, and our School of Professional Studies enrollment this fall is about even with what it was last year, although I do want to mention that the spring and summer SPS new student enrollment was up 67%, so there was some really nice growth uh, over these past two uh, sessions. This fall, we're about even with where we were last year. 
In regard to, um, and I think the other big event that's going to really help from an enrollment growth standpoint is the advent of men's and women's lacrosse here on campus. Uh, we've already got two of our coaches on board, and they're very busily recruiting and trying to bring those rosters to fruition as we start our program next fall. And by the way, just as a reference for those who aren't lacrosse fans, that's a spring sport. So they'll um, get here next fall, start practicing, and then move into competition in the spring of 2018. In regards to strength and stability in academic affairs, a lot of exciting things happening on that front. First and foremost, we've launched nine new majors, and that's been largely through the leadership of our faculty, and in particular, Dr. Duncan, and really excited about the growth that that's going to bring, as well as um, just strengthening the institution overall. We opened our brand new Center for Student Success just a few weeks ago and had, uh, have had a great response from our students, as well as our faculty and staff taking advantage of that. We've made a number of changes in our advising model, and we're already seeing the fruition of that as we're trying to get more of our students being directly advised by our faculty, and that, those changes have really bore a lot of wonderful fruit. Um, under Duncan, Dr. Duncan's leadership, we've had a number of new articulation agreements with some of the community and technical colleges in the region, and we have several more already underway. We have a number of faculty that have really been instrumental in getting a lot of those partnerships started, and we expect that many of those are going to continue to blossom, especially as an area that we believe has tremendous growth as community college enrollment continues to grow, in particular as it attracts um, students directly from high school. And lastly, we've added a number of faculty positions to further, strengthening, uh, to further strengthen our academic areas. We're adding four new full-time faculty positions for next fall. We're already underway in those searches. And we're also searching for several more positions. We could have as many as nine new faculty members on this campus by this time next year. A little bit about connecting with our alumni and friends. As many of you know, we've been working really diligently to, in order to um, start building bridges and um, connecting with folks that maybe we haven't had a chance to visit with for quite a while. We had some wonderful contacts last year. We met with over 1,100 alumni in different forms throughout the year. Uh, we also, through our work um, with grant work, uh, were very successful in uh, getting the Cannon Foundation to um, award us a $100,000 grant that was directed towards um, really exciting things heating and AC in a residence hall. Um, but the great thing about the Cannon Foundation is that they realize that a lot of people don't want to give to um, heating and air conditioning. And so uh, one of their focal points is to really help institutions um, with those types of things that are very difficult to fundraise. And so their gift has enabled us to completely overhaul the system in Davidson Residence Hall. And we're uh, going to be undertaking that over the next several months. And we'll have that ready to go by hopefully by spring semester. We exceeded all of our event goals last year by 103%. Now, one could argue, Brian, you must not have set some very high goals. Um, there's probably a little bit of truth to that, but the fact of the matter is we had wonderful attendance at all of our regional events as well as many of our on-campus events. One that I'm personally very, very proud of is that our faculty and staff giving to our annual fund last year more than doubled. And what that tells me, and this isn't about the amount of dollars that our faculty and staff are giving, although that was also very generous, it's about the fact that we have people on this campus who genuinely believe in what we're doing and want to be a part of it, not just in their day-to-day -day work, but um, with their financial commitments. And that speaks volumes to me as their leader, and I'm very humbled by that. And lastly, in a relation to helping us further our relationships with our alumni and friends, we are currently searching for a new director of alumni relations. That position is a new position this year, and we're hopeful that we're going to identify a great leader who will help us to really continue to move this area forward. Lastly, talking about optimizing our resources, as many of you know, we had the opportunity to uh, redistribute a lot of our marketing dollars this year, and we're able to move our website launch up a full year. We're really excited about the launch of the website. It's uh, the response that we've got from a lot of our prospective students and friends have been, has been really been outstanding, and we're very excited about that. We have um, 40 more students living on campus this year than we did last year, actually more than that, but 40 new just in Maine Residence Hall. Uh, we opened Maine up this fall after a couple years of uh, it being offline. We put in some new dollars in there to help enhance the living experience, and by all the reports that I've heard so far, um, all of the students are really enjoying being in Maine, especially the wonderful view, but also just being in the center of campus and having an opportunity to engage in campus life. Um, I love having the students in the building. It just creates a whole different level of vitality and dynamism um, in our building. We're also deploying a new financial aid model that we believe is going to help us attract and enroll and retain more students going forward. And then lastly, the, um, the acquisition of Seaboard Station certainly occurred a number of years ago, but when I think about optimizing our resources and the success that we're seeing with Seaboard Station, not only because it's at 100% occupancy and we have a wonderful mix of tenants, but also because of the new relationship that we're forming with Harris Teeter and many of the opportunities that are going to come along with that, we are very, very excited about the potential for Seaboard and how we can use that to further the institution. 
So let's talk a little bit about where we're headed. So the name of our strategic plan as we're moving forward is the Believe in Peace plan. And this plan is going to be both inspirational and aspirational. Um, the plan is going to be designed to run anywhere from five to ten years in length. And uh, as we develop uh, the plan over the next six to seven months, uh, we'll be able to fine-tune how, how long the plan is going to be. But it's certainly going to be a plan that is uh, going to be active and also very agile. The Believe in Peace plan has a couple different components of it. First and foremost, the foundation of the plan um, obviously needs to be founded not only on our institutional mission, but also on the, our institutional values. Uh, as I announced to campus several weeks ago, we have a strategic planning group uh, that is comprised of about 16 people across campus, both faculty and staff, and several of them are also alums of this institution. And we're currently having a dialogue about what our institutional values are. We don't currently have any stated values. Um, it's not that we don't value things, but we don't have any current stated values that are explicit for this institution. And so we're going to be working hard to first and foremost define what the highest values are for this institution as a foundation for our long-term plan. Next, we're going to take a look at our mission statement. We're going to make sure that it still lines up with where we are and where we're headed, make adjustments if necessary. But if not, then we're going to affirm that mission statement as part of this process. There are three areas as part of the pillars of the, of the plan, if you will. Um, first and foremost are strategic themes. And the institution has been engaged in talking about strategic themes. And I'm going to highlight those here in just a few minutes. But the strategic themes generally are the uh, general umbrella areas under which that we're going to operate in moving the institution forward. The second area is our strategies and objectives. Strategy is basically what are we going to do under each of these theme areas, and the objectives are going to be how do we know that we did it well. Measurement and accountability are going to be key hallmarks of this plan, both because we believe a lot of what we do can be measured. There are certainly some things that we do that cannot be measured, but some things that we can do, we want to measure it and make sure that we're monitoring our progress against that and also holding ourselves accountable to moving this institution forward. The last component, of course, is the vision. And uh, once we start framing the plan out a bit, we're going to talk a lot more about what the vision of, for this institution is going to be. Uh, as you can imagine, once the themes are aligned and once we start developing strategies, that's going to allow the vision to emerge about where we're going to be for the long term. And I think that's going to be an exciting time of the process. So let's talk briefly about the planning process. We, as I mentioned earlier, we've had a number of steps in the planning process already. The uh, leadership team met off-site for about a day and a half. We're using a consulting firm to assist us with the strategic planning process. And so we went to their site, which is in Whitsett, North Carolina, just outside of the thriving metropolis of Burlington, North Carolina. And we had a great visit with them in developing some um, key ideas of where we want to head as an institution. We next went through a part or in the middle of a community engagement uh, components of our plan. Uh, first and foremost, we started with our faculty and staff and had a great experience in talking through some of the ideas and where we want to go as a part of this planning process. We next engaged with the Board of Trustees, followed by meeting with the Alumni Board, um, spending um, about an hour and a half with our students and SGAs facilitating that discussion tomorrow afternoon to work with them, the student body to get some input on the strategic planning process. And then lastly, I'll also be meeting with some community partners along the way, and we'll be pulling some folks in from the region to help talk about where we're headed as an institution. Um, during this time period, over the next several months, uh, Credo is also uh, collecting all of this information that we're collecting and feeding it to them, and they're assimilating it and putting together some key findings that are going to be turned over to the Strategic Planning Committee. That committee is going to have a, a kickoff meeting in December. We actually had a preliminary meeting just a couple weeks ago. Um, from that group, we're going to uh, emerge into or roll out into theme teams. Theme teams are going to be groups of faculty and staff. They're going to be lined up under each of the major themes that we're going to develop and move forward as part of the planning process. They'll spend a couple months developing ideas and strategies that could possibly emerge um, and be utilized and executed under the theme team uh, under each theme. They'll present that work to the planning team. The planning team will then fine tune the plan and then uh, we'll be bringing the findings to the campus committee and then ultimately to the board of trustees for their review and endorsement. And then from there, we will launch the plan in May of 2017. So we have a very aggressive timeline and it overlaps beautifully with the bridge plan. So what I'm excited to share with you so far is that we've already had four key themes emerge. And there's a couple other areas that have come up that we're going to talk more about and the planning team is going to be talking a lot more about in December. But I want to highlight just a couple of those for you today. First and foremost is immersive learning. And don't worry, I'm going to explain what each of these are in just a moment. Secondly is having a distinctive identity as an institution. Third is pursuing innovative partnerships. 
And then lastly, um, and importantly, is to, um, making sure that we are all about strategic growth as an institution. So let's talk about immersive learning. Um, we believe that learning occurs everywhere, and we must intentionally design transformational experiences both in and out of the classroom that thoroughly and comprehensively engage our students. Now, examples of this could include things such as internships, um, perhaps study away, group projects, leadership opportunities, faculty and student research, critical thought symposiums, things along those lines. And of course, these, all those types of experiences that I just mentioned are designed to engage students. Uh, they're designed um, to both help them in their learning process, but also help them be successful, not only here, but beyond. And the great news is that we're doing some of this already. And uh, I thought better than me telling you a little bit more about what we're doing, it might be a little bit easier for you to hear about some of the great work that Dr. Bonner and Dr. Meyer are doing um, in the immersive learning concept. The biology department and the chemistry department, actually, it's an interdisciplinary program, have been involved in a long-term study, probably about 15 years. Uh, and we have looked at the biological integrity of Crabtree Creek. Uh, recently, our research has shifted its focus onto PCB research because there has been a company upstream of Crabtree uh, that dumped PCBs, which is uh, a carcinogen among many other carcinogens. Uh, and it has since been closed down. Um, it's currently classified as an EPA Superfund cleanup site. And so our student research lately has been involved in assessing the PCB contamination in that entire ecosystem, uh, starting from the headwaters where the, where the spill occurred, well, actually the dump occurred, um, down to the Noose River, because Crabtree is a major tributary of the Noose River. Um, they contaminated a huge site. It's actually one of the EPA's most funded sites, cleanup sites. Um, so it's actually a bigger deal than I ever thought it was. So There's still a lot of PCBs in the surrounding areas, and not only the fist, it's in the water and in all the trophic levels, so it's pretty bad. So people shouldn't be eating fish at all. So it's a, it's a tremendous example of our faculty and students working side by side and having these really tremendous immersive experiences, um, especially those students who literally get immersed in the waters of the Crabtree Creek. Sorry, I had to do it. Um, but it's a great opportunity for our students literally to be working side by side and getting a chance to not just see what's maybe transpiring in the lab or hearing what they're doing in a lecture, but really being able to apply that kind of learning experience um, out in the field. And I think that we can um, use this as a model for how we can have immersive of experiences on our campus across all of our disciplines. So let's talk a little bit more about distinctive identity. Um, as you can imagine, as an institution, we aspire to be recognized as providing um, not only an outstanding and unique educational experience, but also an employee experience and being a great place to work. Uh, we can achieve distinction, obviously, through curricular and co-curricular pathways, um, and importantly, be able to talk a lot about the out outcomes that our students are having, both whether they're heading on to graduate school or into the workforce. And I also believe that if we do our work well, we're going to be a place that a lot of people want to work, and we can, we'll have the ability to attract outstanding faculty and great staff who really want to help move this institution forward. So what identity is not is our logo. Um, and I think it's important to remember that what as an institution's distinctive identity is all about, it's gonna be what we are actually known for, not how we are recognized. And um, I think it's gonna be really important for us to be known to be an institution that provides a high quality educational experience for our students. We are certainly known for our location and having a very enviable location in a fantastic city. We're known for our passionate and dedicated faculty and staff. And we're known for being, um, you know, for a lot of different things, including being a great place to work. Um, but at the end of the day, what I really believe that we should be known for as an institution is our graduates. 
and how our graduates are performing um, after they leave William Peace University. Uh, we can do a lot of great work here, but at the end of the day, people are going to measure what kind of educational experience we're providing by how they, what our graduates are doing after they finish up here. Um, you know, as one of my colleagues says that uh, it used to be that schools were known for who they did not let in. But the future of higher education is about the types of graduates that institutions are sending out. And I think that we have an opportunity to be known for the quality of our graduates as, that we are sending out. Um, as many of you know, we do a lot of things really, really well here, and I think uh, this graphic will um, give you a little bit of an idea of some of the exciting things that are happening here at William Peace University. This is a word cloud, and all of the different words on the screen represent the outcomes of our last three graduating classes. Um, our last three graduating classes, on average, have been employed or in graduate school within one year at 97%, and those numbers are truly, truly remarkable. But what I'm also proud about is the diversity of the organizations and graduate programs that you see on the screen here. And again, this is just the last three years. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really exciting to think about is what kind of careers and lives the graduates that are in each of those places of employment or um, schools of higher learning, uh, what kind of lives are going to emerge out of those places? What kind of impact are our students having already in the workforce or in some of those graduate programs? And I think it's impressive that, um, that, again, this is just a sampling of the last three years. And there's some great organizations that are not only here, but across the globe. One of the things that I think is going to be important for identity going forward is that this graphic continues to get bigger and stronger, and that as our graduates continue to have success um, and start making an impact in society at greater and greater levels, that that is from which our identity emerges. And I think that could be a very, very distinctive place for William Peace University. Let's talk a little bit about innovative partnerships, the third theme that we discussed earlier. Our ability to leverage not only our Raleigh location, but also our alumni network is going to be critically important to our long-term success. Raleigh and the region, as we all know, afford us opportunities to partner with our successful graduates and organizations, including corporations, small businesses, government, nonprofit, all of those can provide opportunities for our students, uh, living and learning experiences through internships and co-ops, guest lectures, off-site experiences, curricular innovation, and obviously employment of our graduates. But they also, this region also offers our students with a lot of opportunities in entertainment, culture, and the arts. And strong engagement with our alumni, as well as organizational partnerships, are certainly going to also breed uh, wonderful opportunities for philanthropic growth and development, grants, gifts in kind, and things along those lines. Um, I, I, one of the, my most favorite examples of how our alumni network and partnerships are working is that we have an alumna, and I believe Gail might be here. Did I see Gail earlier? Hey, Gail. So Gail's one of our alums from our School of Professional Studies, and Gail hosts four to five WPU interns every year in her unit. And can you imagine if all of our alumni base was able to even just host one intern every year, the types of experiences and transformation that could take place on this campus. So Gail, can we thank you for the great work that you're doing with our interns? And that's just one of the many examples that I think are available to our students. But I also thought it'd be helpful to see maybe some of the partnerships that we already have in place today. My favorite part of the day is probably morning meeting. All the kids come in and they, first we have a greeting, whether it's a fist bump or a handshake or a high five, every kid is getting spoken to, um, which is really important. Then we do like a sharing activity and all of these just really foster community. And that's really important to begin the day um, to know that you've been spoken to, you've shared something about yourself, kind of get your energy out with a little game. My favorite aspect of the education program is hands down the student teaching experience because I'm able to apply everything that I've learned for the past two years in the department in this classroom. It's all really great. I enjoy all of it. Um, all of the subjects are fun to teach. The kids are energetic. Maybe that's, I think, you know, this is going to sound kind of cliche, but being around kids all day is, is a lot of fun. <laughs>
but I have worked with student teachers from other universities um, and from William Peace what stands out is they're really prepared they do a lot of um, they have a lot of different opportunities um, from talking with Paige I know that she has a lot of projects and things that she has to do which I think are going to really prepare them to be an educator I feel 100% prepared to go into this experience. That's why I chose Peace. I like the community. I like the uh, fact that the professors know your name, whether you're in their department or not. You know, you've probably had at least one class with them. And just the community is the best part. So obviously student teaching, you can't pick a more, um, just a, a more exciting opportunity from a partnership standpoint than having a school working side by side with our education department to make sure that our student teachers are getting an unbelievably enriching experience and an opportunity for them to, be, to grow and develop as teachers. And I believe that there are a lot of opportunities, as does the community as we've affirmed this theme, that we can have innovative partnerships all over the place where our students are getting experiences that can really challenge them and develop them and help them grow. And also organization, we can benefit organizations by bringing our talented students into their places of work um, and allowing them to make an impact while they're still enrolled here. So let's talk about strategic growth, our last theme. Um, as we all know, uh, William Peace University must grow and become a bigger, stronger version of itself. As a university, we seek the vibrancy and dynamism that results from strategically planned growth in enrollment. We want our current students to succeed and graduate at higher rates than they currently are. We want to attract new students by optimizing our existing markets, as well as expanding into new markets, both programmatic and geographic. Growth in enrollment is going to create stronger revenues that can be invested into the student experience, both curricular and co-curricular, our faculty and staff, and our, fac and our facilities. So how do we make strategic growth happen? Uh, there's going to be a lot of different ways that we are going to pursue strategic growth. Um, and it will come from a lot of different areas. Not one of these is going to certainly be responsible for um, all of our growth. But certainly the new majors that we have added and that we'll continue to add in a strategic manner going forward. Um, the addition of obviously men's and women's lacrosse and potentially other sports as we grow our athletics program. We're going to be deploying a lot of new admission strategies going forward and that absolutely is going to be catalytic to our growth. We continue to work hard on new retention strategies and student success strategies, and I believe that that will also dramatically enhance our ability to grow from an enrollment standpoint. And I think that as we continue to have more and more success, as the reputation of William Peace University continues its um, ascent, that that also will help us grow going forward. But how does this all add up? So what you see on the slide are some very aggressive and perhaps too bold of some goals that we would like to see come to fruition. We have an aggressive goal of 50% growth in our new students for next fall. Um, and so the first question you're going to ask is, how in the world are we going to do that? That's a great question. Uh, first and foremost, we believe that lacrosse is going to be a catalyst for growth. Now, we don't fully expect the programs to be at their maturity next fall, um, but once those rosters mature, we'll likely have 40 to 45 men on the men's lacrosse team and 30 to 35 women on the women's lacrosse team. As I mentioned earlier, we've got nine new majors. Certainly, those are going to generate a lot of new students who otherwise would not have chosen William Peace University, in particular because several of those areas are new disciplines for us. Um, third, the number of articulation agreements that we've already deployed and are continuing to work through are going to create uh, more and more pipelines for students who are in community and technical colleges looking for that opportunity to move on and earn their bachelor's degree. And we believe there's a lot of students in those areas. Uh, just as an example, we have a new articulation agreement with Wake Tech and Business Analytics, and Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong, but they have 350, is that right, students in their two-year business analytics program. Uh, you better believe that some of those students, in fact, many of them, are looking for bachelor's degrees opportunities. So we believe that those type of pipelines are certainly going to um, bring about additional growth. And under Dr. Cohen's leadership, we have a lot of new admission strategies that are being deployed right now to impact next fall's numbers. And so, yes, it's a really um, significant jump, but we believe if everything goes in our direction that we could certainly see that as a possibility of happening next fall. 
We also have set a very aggressive goal of being at 900 um, traditional or day students by next fall, and that's 12.5% growth. So that means not only all of the admission strategies coming to fruition, um, but all the magic dust that Dawn and her team have been spreading um, in the areas of retention and student success that we believe are going to really be able to um, help us continue to improve in keeping the students we have here. Because um, we all agree, at the end of the day, what we want them to do most importantly is to have a great experience here, graduate, and go on and make a difference in the world. And so, the more work that we can do in helping those students achieve that goal, the better work we're going to, the better outcomes we're going to see in enrollment. We believe that we can have a thousand traditional day students by the year 2020. Um, and we also have set some long-term goals of trying to get to 1,500 traditional day students. As many of you know, I shared that number uh, during my installation speech, and I'm uh, just as convinced now as I was then that that's something that we need to be aiming for, and 500 SPS students. And if you remember from the first slide, we're at 243 right now, so that's more than doubling our School of Professional Studies enrollment. We also have a long-term goal of having 1,000 residential students. Now, some of you are not breathing right now, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> Yes, these are stretch goals, and there's, there's no question about it. But I will argue that if we do not think boldly, we are not going to be able to act boldly. And so the first step that we need to take is by thinking boldly, and that's why you're seeing a lot of these numbers. Now, I will also say that um, the reason I have this calculus slide up here is because we believe that with the strategies that we're putting in place, that these are attainable numbers. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not big stretch goals. They are. But we think that with really some successful execution on our strategies, that these are within reach. Um, now, obviously, we're going to need to reassess these numbers as we continue to grow to make sure they still make sense. Um, and of course, we're going to need to plan for this type of growth. And so you can imagine that a lot of the discussions that we're already starting to have is if this happens, or if we want this to happen, what are the things that we need to be thinking about now to make sure that we not only are be providing the right catalysts for that growth, but also the right accommodation for that growth. And so certainly we're going to need to look at the number of faculty that we have, the number of staff that we have, residential space, uh, 1,000 beds, of course. We don't have that right now. We're just about 415 or so on campus. So how do we get to 1,000 beds, um, that, that likely will mean you know, some uh, creative ideas in regard to developing or building or partnerships. We have some of those in place right now, but we certainly are going to need to explore more. And it also means that we're going to have to really assess our classroom and lab space and how we can make sure that we can accommodate that kind of growth successfully. Uh, the one exciting thing, um, and this is not to uh, monetize things too much, but as you, as you all know, that with enrollment growth comes additional net tuition revenue. And we'll be able to take that enrollment growth revenue and invest it into some of these very things that I'm talking about to really enhance the experience for our students, but also for everybody who works here um, to make sure that we're providing the best student experience possible. So what is the state of the university? Well, I believe that we're in a solid position. I believe that our financial stability has improved, although we certainly have a lot more work to do. Um, we don't want to just be stable. We want to be thriving. And we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that we do that well. Uh, I do believe that we're executing our bridge plan strategies well. And I think that has created at least a solid feel at this point. We're getting stronger. We're adding new faculty positions. We've had substantive improvement in student success, which makes us stronger as an institution. When we have more students who are achieving at higher rates, that makes us better as an institution. It creates a more dynamic environment on campus. Um, also, frankly, even just having 40 more residential students on campus, you can feel it on this campus this fall. And it's an exciting time, and we're definitely getting stronger. I believe that we're on the move. We have a lot of folks, both in this room and elsewhere, that are out in the community talking about William Peace University. We're getting new partnerships in place. We've got a lot of these new articulation agreements in place. Um, there's a lot of great things happening on that front. We're also connecting with our alumni and friends, and that's part of being on the move, getting out and really connecting with the people who uh, matter to us and who can make a difference for us. I believe that we are poised for growth. We have a lot of new strategies in place that are going to make us stronger and yield higher enrollment. We have plans in place not only to accommodate that growth, but we also have plans in place to continue to stimulate that growth, not just this year, this year, but in years coming. And I also believe that on campus, and I may be a little bit presumptuous, but I think in general our campus really aligns with the idea that we need to be growing to be stronger. And in, in order for us to do that, we've got to be poised for that growth. I think that we're thinking boldly and acting courageously. 
Uh, I will tell you that in the first couple months of this fall, as we've engaged in the Believe in Peace, peace planning process, to say that three times fast, um, I've been inspired by the ideas that have come from our faculty and our staff, from our board of trustees, and from our alumni. And I'm eager to hear what the students have to say tomorrow. Um, but I do believe that there's a lot of big ideas and big thinking going on. Uh, we're demonstrating a lot of courage on this campus. We have a lot of people who are stopping what they're doing in certain areas and starting new ideas. And that takes a lot of courage because it's sometimes hard to stop something you've done for a while. And yet we have a lot of people demonstrating that very behavior. Um, and we're doing a lot of new things. I've been so encouraged to hear some of the stories that Dr. Duncan has shared about some of the new and exciting things that our faculty are doing in campus and out in the field. We have staff trying new things. Our residence life staff has been undertaking a lot of different initiatives this year to build community in a different way. Uh, there's just a lot of neat things happening. Our student athletes are as engaged as ever. And so a lot of fun things that are happening on that front and allowing us to be thinking boldly and acting courageously. I think the campus ethos right now is, is nothing short of inspiring. The engagement has absolutely been spectacular, and everyone seems to be looking forward. In short, I believe that we, as a campus, are ready to believe. Thank you very much for your time today, and I'd be happy to move to some questions. Thank you. So the way that this, this next portion is going to work, we had a number of folks that had submitted their questions ahead of time, so I'm going to start with those. And then we have microphones that are located here, and if you have a question we'd like to step forward, we'll have some folks that will be working with you to moderate those questions. And then I'll also check in with our social media team to see if we've had anybody tweet in questions and hopefully not anything too nasty. Um, <laughs> so the uh, first question that was submitted to me, uh, and these are all uh, anonymous. So, as you well know, WPU employees have not had a cost of living increase or any raises in a decade. Would you outline your plan to help us in this area? When can we expect a cost of living increase? When can we expect raise, raises beyond the cost of living? Uh, let me first and foremost say that I developed a potential list of questions before we asked for questions, and this was the very first question on my list as well, so uh, please know that it's certainly a welcome question. Um, I first and foremost want to share that there is not a higher priority for the leadership team, um, for our board of trustees, and certainly for me, than to try to address our faculty and staff compensation. Um, we have to address that as soon as we are able. Um, we are very fortunate that through some um, hard work this year, we were able to actually reduce health care costs for this year, but frankly, compensation is a much bigger issue, and we fully recognize that. Um, to in somewhat state the obvious, what you just heard is uh, what I believe one of the key ways that we're going to be able to address faculty and staff compensation, and that is executing on our Believe in Peace plan and having strategic growth. Um, as enrollment really has been flat for the last several years, we don't have new resources that are coming to bear that we have been able to invest in our faculty and staff. As enrollment grows, um, what I can promise you is that uh, faculty staff compensation will be the first thing in which we invest going forward. Um, I'm hopeful that we can hit some of these stretch goals next year and be able to tackle some of these issues. Um, but until then, um, I ask for your patience and all the hard work that you've already been demonstrating in helping us move this institution forward and what I believe is going to hopefully bring about the enrollment growth that we need to, um, to facilitate investments and most importantly in our people. Um, I will share that we have been conducting a salary study, um, and we're doing that with a couple different reasons. First and foremost, to get an understanding of where our current compensation levels are for our faculty and staff, how they relate to like institutions, aspirational institutions, and the general market. Uh, as you can imagine, some of our faculty and staff uh, line up very well with, with um, different um, institutions across the board. And, but we also have other areas, frankly, that we have a lot of work to do in improving faculty and staff compensation. And, um, but the study is going to be really important and helpful to us as we start assessing what it will take for us to truly invest in our, in our people. Um, but I am hopeful that we'll be able to do that as soon as possible. Um, I don't have a timeline. I think one of the parts of the questions is how soon. Um, I don't know. I, I, I wish that I had an enrollment crystal ball. Uh, what I can tell you that if we achieve some of the enrollment goals that we've set forward as early as next year, that this will be the first area that we'll invest in going forward. All right, question number two. Will William Peace University think about offering a graduate program in the future? The very short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is that we certainly are going to think about graduate programs as part of our strategic planning process. 
We are currently working through our five-year report to our accrediting body, the Southern Association for Colleges and Schools um, Commission on Colleges. Uh, that five-year report is, uh, we just got the letter actually this week. Our report is due back to them in one year, and then we hear, um, we have, it's kind of an iterative process for a couple months, but I expect that we will hopefully bring that five-year report to conclusion in the early parts of uh, 2018. When we do that, uh, the very next thing that we can do at that point is then engage in a dialogue with our accrediting body about uh, the possibilities of William Peace University offering graduate programs. And so that kind of gives you a rough timeline of when it could possibly happen should we decide that it makes sense strategically. I do know that there are a lot of people on this campus that thinks that it makes a lot of sense strategically. Um, question number three, as a result of the past, a lot of alumni have felt alienated. You've been working on abridging the gap, um, but there is still not yet not as large, oh, um, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that, bridging the gap, but it is still there, although not as large as it was. What are specific actions you are going to take um, or continue to take to reach out to us and bridge the gap? We certainly do have more work to do to bridge the gap. I'm glad that this uh, person thinks that we have made some progress, I do as well, um, but there definitely is more work to be done. Specific actions that we're taking, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to hire Direct Alumni Relations, which is a new position uh, for the campus. We did have it uh, several years ago, but it's certainly an important position to help build those relationships with our alumni and friends. We are increasing our communication with our alumni. We are gonna continue to travel to our alumni, and we have got a number of events planned this fall. We're gonna have more this spring, and we will continue to do that going forward. And we're also gonna work hard to make sure that we're inviting our alumni back to more and more events. And so those are some of the specific actions that we're taking. Uh, the same author. Additionally, are you going to bring more Peace College items back to the bookstore, as in not just the stuff that is, not, that is there now, but a legitimate Peace College alumni section? Uh, the short answer to this is no, um, at least not in the bookstore um, on campus. Uh, they have very limited space and they have a lot of demands for that space. Uh, I have spoken with our, our bookstore and they've agreed to take uh, input on the types of items that people may want that we don't currently carry. Uh, the best way to do that is to email them at peace at bookstore, B-K-S-T-R dot com. And what the bookstores agreed to do is take all of the ideas that are submitted from our Peace College alumni, and if there are some items that make sense that we could add to the online bookstore, we certainly will ex uh, explore that. Um, the website that for our bookstore, just in case anybody's curious, is williampeaceshop.com. And again, the email address, if you want to send ideas, is peace at bkstr.com. I do want our alumni to understand, however, that this does present a significant marketing and branding challenge for the institution, which is why all of the items that you see in the bookstore have the word alumni on it. Um, and that is simply because um, as we move forward, we need to be known in the marketplace as William Peace University. That is not to be an affront to our history or to the people who graduated from Peace College, but as we move forward and want to grow, it's going to be really important for us to be known as William Peace University. Uh, we'll continue to try to work as hard as we can to provide the right alumni options um, but that's where we're going to be headed going forward. All right, fifth question. Why isn't peace marketing itself as having higher academic standards so it attracts more scholarly applicants than neighboring colleges? That way it stands out more from neighboring colleges and alumni are more highly viewed as achievers and thus more attractive in the job market. Um, I do think that we're doing some decent work here, and certainly there's more work to be done. Um, we have been working hard to overhaul the admissions and marketing practices, um, and I think that there's a lot of new strategies that are going to be de that are being deployed and will continue to be deployed that are going to attract strong students who are a great fit for William Peace University. My expectations at this point is that we are going to grow and not in any way diminish the quality of our incoming students. I do think that over time we'll be able to increase the quality of the students that are coming to William Peace University, um, but that's not going to happen overnight. Um, it's going to take a lot of time and discipline, but I do think that is a likely outcome over time. Question number six, if you were to choose one priority to be the most important next year, which one would it be and why? And I'm very happy to report that the senior leadership team all answered this question correctly. Um, and that is our highest priority is enrollment growth. And why enrollment growth? Well, in, in our case, everybody wins. Um, and let me tease that out a little bit. First and foremost, um, when our students are succeeding at higher rates and we're having higher retention rates, 
our students win. When we attract more students to William Peace University, it generates more tuition revenue that we're then able to invest in our people, our students, and our facilities. So enrollment growth is uh, our highest priority going forward. Now, it's not going to be growth forever. We're going to certainly look at different step po um, steps along the way to see what makes sense. But certainly in the near and in intermediate term, uh, the name of the game for us is growth. It is not growth at all costs, however. In reference to the previous question, we're not opening the floodgates from an admission standpoint. We have rigor around our admission standards, and we're going to continue to use that going forward. Number seven, out of the parking lot ideas that came from the bridge plan, which one is most likely to happen in the next year? So first and foremost, for those of you that are not familiar with the bridge plan or parking lot ideas, uh, part of the bridge plan process was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to identify strategies that could be deployed within six to 18 months that would help us move those four pillars forward in as rapidly ma rapid manner as possible. The parking lot concept was simply my request that as you're meeting, you're going to come up with some great ideas that may not fit in that six to 18 month time frame, but could be great ideas for William Peace University long term. Put them in the figurative parking lot, and we'll continue to talk about those in the long-term strategic plan. Well, as you can imagine, some really great ideas came out of that process that went into the parking lot. And some of those parking lot ideas, frankly, were deployed because we thought they were such a good idea that we went ahead and moved forward with some of those. And so in response to the question, um, what are some of the ideas that are going to be moved forward? So men's and women's lacrosse originally was a parking lot idea. We moved it up, and we launched men's and women's lacrosse. Uh, we pursued numerous par um, partnerships and articulation agreements this year under Dr. Duncan's leadership. That was more of a long-term idea that we were going to do after we got a little bit further into the strategic plan. Um, new majors, we really thought that those were going to be part of the long-term strategic plan. They absolutely will, but there were several that made a lot of sense, many um, that were brought up through our faculty that made a lot of sense, and we moved some of those uh, forward now. Most recently, the item that has just come off the parking lot and into our uh, bridge plan is the advent of new summer academic camps starting this coming summer. Um, and we have some of that, I think many of them are coming out of the science areas, and that was a bridge, um, a parking lot idea that we've moved up because we believe that there's some tremendous potential in through our summer academic summer camps. So that would be the most recent example. Uh, question number eight, it has uh, been difficult to schedule classes in computer labs uh, when needed, especially during spring semester. What are the plans for additional computer labs or other ways to address need for classroom use of technology? Uh, we're exploring a couple different areas to address this. Uh, first and foremost, we're looking at whether or not we need to create additional lab space, but also we're looking at the potential of creating a mobile lab. Um, that would likely be done through the purchase and use of a laptop cart. You've probably seen some of these in the K-12 system, that basically the cart can be brought into any classroom and turn that classroom into a portable lab. And so those are a couple things that are being explored. Um, both Josh Frank and Dr. Duncan are working through some of that. So with that, let me uh, pause and see what questions, additional questions we may have from the audience or if we have any through social media um, or if, uh, if not any follow-up questions to any of the items I've covered before. So we have three questions from our social media. Excellent. And we can start with those. Anybody who would like to ask a question from the floor, we do have this mic and the one on the other side, so feel free to join me at the mic if you so dare. Um, but our first question is, uh, what are your plans in the coming years to house and accommodate students in classrooms in preparation of a 50% growth? Very good. Um, so plans, Let, we'll talk about housing first. Um, certainly, if we're going to grow to 1,000 residential students or 50% growth, we're going to need more beds. Uh, some of our preliminary projections for next fall is that we can probably fit into our existing beds, but it'll be really, really, really tight. Um, and that's if we hit those, those benchmarks for next fall. Um, it, we are watching, obviously, we, uh, we're now going to be having weekly admissions reports um, on, from Dr. Cohen, and so we're going to be watching those applications and admits and deposits very carefully. If they are trending north of those, we will have some uh, backup plans in place. One of the great things that we have is a great partnership with the V at Raleigh. Uh, you may recall just two years ago, we master leased three buildings out there, and so uh, they know that we have some growth plans, and so if we need to approach them early on and say, hey, we may need to uh, 
master lease some additional beds or possibly a floor or a building, depending on how much we grow. Um, those are things that we'll be able to pull. Now, they don't have a ton of flexibility because they need to know far enough in advance to plan for that. Um, but they've been great with us so far, and so we certainly would deploy um, every resource we could to possibly enhance that partnership further should we need to. Um, so that's one solution from a residential standpoint. We also certainly want to look at what it would take to possibly construct a residential facility closer to campus that we would potentially own. Um, and that could, be, that could take a lot of different forms, whether it's another residence hall um, in the mold of what we already have on campus. Ideally, I think we'd love to have a residence hall that would be apartment style, that would be owned and, led, um, by the, owned and run by the university. But those are a couple different options that we would, and levers that we would need to pull should that growth come about. Uh, in regard to classroom space, I think was the second question. That is. Uh, some of the stuff, we have had a classroom utilization study done. It was done several years ago, but a lot of the data still holds true. It looks like based on the study that we can probably get to 980 to 1,000 or so students in our uh, day program with some creative use of classrooms and not really need to run into too many headaches. Beyond that, we're going to have to look at some different strategies. And there's a lot of different ways that institutions manage growth in classroom utilization. Everything from, obviously, building more buildings, but also uh, hybrid use of classrooms where there might be um, an integration of both uh, online and on ground uh, interactions where students may not have to be in the classroom on Tuesdays but only on Thursdays, then you can double the number of sections for the same time slot, different things like that that we'll need to look at. Um, I think the area that will probably feel the most crunch, frankly, are gonna, is going to be our lab space, and so we're going to have to be very creative in how we solve for that lab space, whether it's here or whether we need to look for other partnerships um, to do that. Do we have any questions from the audience? Or we can go to Twitter question number two. Sure. Uh, the question was, what's the plan for using Seaboard Station to accommodate some of that growth? Uh, certainly, Seaboard offers a couple different options. Uh, first and foremost, we're currently at 100% occupancy, which is a great problem to have. Uh, so there isn't any current space there. But as we look at the development of Seaboard, uh, there could be a lot of different options that we could explore. Certainly, there's some land there that if we had the good fortune of possibly being able to do some student housing there, that might be an option that we could consider. Uh, there also could be um, some partnerships with other organizations over there, whether it's internship sites and things like that. In regard to classroom space or anything like that, the development of Seaboard really is um, in its infancy in that regard, and so I don't know that I don't know that that would necessarily be, but that space is there for discussion for sure. But as you can imagine, there's a lot of great potential at, at Seaboard, um, in particular, as, you, as we all know, with Harris Teeter uh, jumping in, that's going to provide tremendous retail opportunities going forward. But we do want to make sure, just so everybody knows, that we're working really hard to make sure that Seaboard Station and the main campus really have a great complementary relationship. So there's a lot of thinking um, from the Seaboard board around what types of tenants and what types of mix do we want to have over there that will enhance the quality of the student experience, raise the profile of the institution, but also very candidly generate the revenue from uh, the retail side that will allow uh, the institution to move forward from a financial standpoint as well. And as we all know, Raleigh is, is growing quickly, and so there's been a lot of interest in, in where we're headed with Seaboard. And it's an exciting time and certainly a, an unbelievably courageous investment that's gonna, that I think is really, really proving itself out well. Our next question is, since enrollment growth is heavily emphasized, will the ratio of students to faculty change as well? Hmm. So uh, as we all know, ratio is a moving target. Um, there's a numerator and denominator. We will work hard to keep those uh, in balance. Uh, there may be times that that gets a little out of whack. And frankly, sometimes that may mean because we've got to hire faculty in advance of the enrollment growth in order to develop a high quality program. And at other times it may mean that we can grow in advance of adding faculty and then add faculty as the growth accommodates uh, or enables us to do that. So uh, we're certainly committed to trying to keep our faculty student ratios as reasonable as possible uh, for a couple reasons. One, we believe the, the quality of the educational experience can be compromised if we get into huge situations. Um, and very candidly, as we all know, we're physically constrained. Um, the beauty of our class classroom space is that uh, it has it finite limits. It's concrete. And so um, we uh, will, by, by its very nature of, our, of the structures we currently have, we'll definitely have to keep our class sizes smaller. Yep. 
Sure. Thanks, Cal. Um, so uh, we have um, part of the enrollment growth process, obviously, uh, one of the areas that we've talked a lot about is obviously investing in our faculty and staff, but we also need to desperately invest in our facilities going forward. Uh, we have a very understaffed facilities area, so we need some additional investment just to help, um, help that area. But then also from a capital improvement standpoint, there are a lot of areas of deferred maintenance. In fact, I think we're having a meeting next week um, or next couple weeks to look at that list of all the areas that, um, that need both investment as well as areas that we want to invest in that maybe we don't even currently have on campus. So a portion of every budget that we develop is around capital investment. So as our enrollment growth develops and as those new revenues come to bear, uh, the leadership team will be sitting down and talking about what the highest um, needs are from a facilities standpoint. Uh, certainly, while Keenan has had some investment, there's more that needs to take place in here. Uh, we, have, we have some uh, additional classroom technology items that we want to solve. We've got some student space issues that we want to solve, in other words, lack thereof. Um, we've got some recreational space challenges that we need to solve and also um, bringing our grounds uh, to a higher level and that again is going to take investment both from a deferred maintenance standpoint as well as just trying to move the institution forward so um, that's part of the every budgeting process that we undertake and there will be some longer term kind of big capital plans if you will um, that might re you know be found in the you know, and such things as a new building or things along those lines those are definitely done outside of the traditional budgeting process and we have one more from social media. Okay. Where will uh, Peace Pacer Lacrosse play without a facility on campus? Mm, good question. So, um, where will the uh, um, lacrosse play? We are exploring a number of different options. So, there are a couple things. One, we were very pleasantly surprised to learn that Halifax Field, which is right down the street, um, had a full renovation, and so the turf is actually in very good shape and could provide, um, and we've been in discussions with them, a great practice facility for our lacrosse programs and frankly, our, our potentially our, some of our soccer programs on off days, although we have a, a wonderful facility out at Wake Med as well. Um, so from a practice standpoint, that's an option that we're exploring. Um, Coach Rowe is also exploring a lot of different partnerships with different areas throughout the region that may have an interest in hosting our practices. In regard to competitive landscape, where we're going to play, uh, we've, we've got about a year to figure that out. Um, we are in discussion with at least two or three different organizations, four uh, organizations that are um, potentially interested in hosting or being our home, pro, our home field for our men's and women's lacrosse. So we don't have anything finite yet at this point, but obviously we're going to let our folks know as soon as we know. Good questions. Other questions? Yes, Nani. What are you playing for Maine? Sure, good question. Uh, so the question was, what are our plans for Maine building? Um, so we, um, the, one of the first things we wanted to do is, is to obviously enhance the, the living experience and open those rooms back up. Uh, there's certainly more that we could do in the, in the uh, third and fourth floor of Maine to further enhance the living experience for our students. Uh, there's definitely some deferred maintenance in Maine. As we all know, that building is, is quite old. Um, and there's both some deferred maintenance and frankly some modernization that could take place. Uh, we've had some conversations about that, but I think there are a lot more conversations to be had um, is for, in regard to you know, where we want Maine to head long term. I think structurally we're doing, we're doing pretty well. We haven't had any major issues or anything like that. Um, so we're very fortunate in that regard. But um, you know, as a as a building, there are, you know it's definitely old, and so we've got some things that we definitely could invest more in. And I think that as we you know talk more about that and what that looks like, um, that'll certainly be something that we're going to want to explore further. Um, it's and I, I mean this tongue in cheek. It's one of many things that we've had on the list of ideas of where we could invest some additional resources should they be available. And we've also had some interest from outside folks that are interested in, in you know, where we're headed with some of our buildings. As we know, um, some of the buildings that we have on campus were only made possible because of people's generosity and their desire in enhancing the, the campus experience. And so uh, you never know when those types of conversations could happen, whether we're with Maine or any other building on campus. We have a, a lot of wonderful names on our, on our buildings throughout campus because people had a vision for what our facilities could be like. Other questions? Hi, Sarah. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about faculty to student ratios, mm -hmm. especially in this type of conversation. But the staff to student ratio is rarely talked about. Is there a plan of a full evaluation of our staff resources and what that looks like and how I think about it across campus? 
Sure. So um, the question was, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around faculty-student ratio, uh, but has there been as much discussion about student, um, I'm sorry, staff-student ratio and just the amount of staffing that we have on campus? Uh, we've not had a kind of a comprehensive um, staffing plan, if you will, discussion, but I would say that we have um, key staffing discussions in, you know, I've only gone through one budget cycle, but when we go through the budgeting cycle, we talk about what are the most acute needs in each of the areas. Um, and frankly, we do that as a team so that everybody on the senior leadership team knows what each uh, vice president is bringing to the table, what those needs are, and then we talk about prioritizing those needs so that should we have the ability to add a position or two or however many that are needed, that we're all in agreement that 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 person or role is the next highest priority going forward. Um, there are certainly areas that we are unbelievably lean. And um, we've got a lot of folks that are working really hard and rowing really hard to um, just to stay above water. And I, and I get that. And we certainly are aware of where some of those areas are. Um, and again, not to um, play the broken record here, but as we grow, those will be areas that we'll try to invest in going forward. And I will say, we've had a lot of good candid conversations about, um, you know, as those additional resources come to bear, uh, how we balance between investing in new positions, um, which are sorely needed and will improve the quality of the work experience for our current faculty and staff, but also investing in our current people um, and balance, having a balancing act for that. So there are, there's, there's a good healthy tension as part of that, for sure. Yes, sir, Dan. Mm -hmm. Yes, great question. So um, in order to grow is one of the additional strategies to develop more partnerships to help us grow enrollment, um, similar to what we have with Wake Tech. And the unequivocal answer is absolutely yes. And those partnerships can come in a lot of different forms. So I think we visited three or four different uh, community technical colleges just in the last three months for different programs that we've not talked to other um, some of those institutions about with before. So that's, and there's a lot of eagerness and excitement from those institutions to provide that particular pathway. Um, frankly, another pathway that we're developing, and this has been relatively recent under Dr. Cohen's leadership, is that we're starting to develop partnerships with schools and organizations in the region to get their, um, their students onto our campus early. Um, now, granted, I don't have any hair to pull out, so I don't have to pull any out, but we had a huge group of eighth graders here, was it last week? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Corralling 150 eighth graders on campus is not an easy task for anyone. Um, but what a great way to plant the seed that William Peace University could be a potential institution for you when you're in eighth grade, when you're in that formative moment and thinking about and trying to envision what collegiate life could be like. And so we've got a lot of those types of strategic partnerships that are starting to evolve with some schools. And then on the flip side of that, we also have some organizations that are really working hard to um, uh, from a community leadership standpoint, opening their community members' eyes to what higher educational opportunities are out there. And we've had some of those organizations um, partnering with us as well. Um, access programs that have really talented, high ability students, but they're first generation college students and don't have anybody modeling what collegiate life looks like in their family or extended family. And a lot of these community organizations are rallying these kids together and helping them see that college could be a potential option for them. And we're partnered with some of those types of organizations as well. But there's lots more to be done. So if you have ideas um, of different partner organizations, we would certainly welcome those. So. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Lori. Beyond enrollment growth, what is your vision for SPS? Beyond <laughs> enrollment growth, what is our vision for SPS? Um, I was really hoping I was not going to get a hard question today. Um, very candidly, um, I think, we, I think part of the strategic planning process is going to be taking a good hard look at how we're currently doing SPS and where SPS needs to go. Um, we've got some really talented folks in that area, and I'm not just saying that because you're in that area, um, but I think that SPS um, has some opportunity to be bigger and stronger than it currently is, and I think that we need to take a step back and look at what's happening in the adult marketplace and the types of students that are looking for educational opportunities, and are we aligned appropriately to do that? And we may answer all these questions 
challenge. Yes, we're perfectly where we need to be, and we need to invest more in our current structure, or we may need to look at different structures. And I know that you've, you've brought forward some ideas of maybe some different structures that might work for us. And I think we need to take a good hard look at that. I think unlike our, our traditional day program, which I think just needs jet fuel, I think that the SPS program needs a, a little bit deeper analysis to decide if we're just pouring more fuel into the, the jet or if we maybe need to change planes. But there will be a plane, no question about that. Yes, sir, coach. The uh, CRC, mm -hmm. that seems like a logical way to expand resources as far as classroom like that. Is that something that's also being uh, looked at to expand it more? And the other universities in the area, are they buying in? Mm, good question. So um, CRC stands for Cooperating Raleigh Colleges. It is a consortium of all of the colleges in the area. Uh, that includes NC State, Meredith, Wake Tech, Shaw, St. Augustine's, and us. And um, it's a really great partnership. There are leadership bodies, both of the CRC as a whole, which is all the presidents, but then each there are a lot of different areas to, um, that are represented on different college campuses that are also engaged through CRC. So the human resources folks meet, the CFOs meet, chief academic officers, student life officers, um, and a variety of other areas as well. Um, and what that consortium first and foremost tries to do is make sure that all the institutions in general are working together as much as possible to enhance the, their student opportunities. The best example that we have is that it allows students, so I'll speak about us in our case, a student at William Peace University can enroll in a course at NC State as part of their uh, tuition here at the institution. Um, so. The great opportunities there is that, uh, obviously, the NC State has a much different course offering menu than, than we do, both from in size and scope. So if a student wants to take, for example, Arabic, uh, we obviously don't offer that, but the student could have an opportunity to take that at a place like NC State. Um, and it allows for all those different institutions, students, to migrate back and forth. Um, I will say that we are, I believe, the second or third largest importer of the six schools. Uh, NC State, as you can imagine, just by size and scope, is the largest importer of students. Um, and I think Meredith and us are probably close second and third. And so uh, we have a lot of students that take advantage of that. In regard to additional partnerships, um, again, I've only been part of the group for a year, so I'd certainly encourage some folks from, that have been engaged longer than I have. But I have noticed an interest in exploring what additional ideas might come about that allow us to um, further enhance what we're trying to do. Uh, there's been recent discussions, for example, um, if I can use the example that was shared with the chief academic officers, of um, every institution around the table said, we have empty seats in every international trip that we take. What would we think about students from other schools being able to go on some of those international trips as part of CRC? Great type of thinking, could open up new opportunities for our students. Uh, there's been discussions about internship sites and possibly having students intern on each other's campuses, or if you've got relationships and you don't have enough interns, are there opportunities for students from other schools? So those would be some examples of things that have been taking place. The other area that I've been very impressed with, frankly, is um, around the emergency planning uh, area, where a lot of the schools have been working very closely in developing emergent, emergency management plans um, on each of the different campuses. We've had folks from NC State that have been really instrumental in helping us uh, with that process, and so I th there's been some things like that as well. Um, any other key examples that any of you would share? I'm sorry? Oh, yes, student research, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so another area that's come up is some interest in possibly having students from different institutions being able to do uh, research with other faculty members from different institutions or students working together from different institutions on a single research project. Uh, so there's some different ideas like that that are, that are percolating up. So I think, I, again, I think the good news is we're not the only people thinking about partnerships. I think a lot of people are looking for ways to, to enhance those going forward. Um, my hope, of course, is, is that we're leading the way on that. We have another question from Great. social media. Great. So you mentioned needs to invest in facility staff. What are, you, what are your plans to attract a larger and competent staff that can handle large scale projects and historic buildings? Um, I don't think it's appropriate for me to respond to that 
question in this setting. Um, I think that what we do want to do is is continue to make sure that we have um, we're staffed appropriately to manage a campus that is old and needs a lot of um, areas of investment. Um, and certainly one area, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is um, if you look at our facilities and managing some of the facilities that we have, um, having a staff of three people is not adequate to support the infrastructure that we have in place. And that is something we absolutely need to invest in going forward and is high on the list. Um, you can ask anybody at senior leadership because we talk about it a lot, um, is an area that we need to invest more in. Yes? Hmm. Good question. Question was, um, are, is there any interest in growing our international student population? There is definitely interest. Uh, we've talked a lot about it, and there's, a, there's been pockets of discussion throughout campus. Um, I would say, and I, and I know that I'm, I'm a little bit uh, counter um, a lot of the thinking across the United States right now, I do not believe that international student growth on our campus right now is as high a priority as overall student growth. And there's a couple reasons for that. First and foremost, um, I think it's irresponsible to recruit international students if you're not equipped to serve those students well. And very candidly, we're not equipped to serve those students well right now. Um, do I think that it's an area that we could grow and with the right resources, invest and support those students well? Absolutely. Do I think that students are attracted to great metropolitan areas like Raleigh? Absolutely. Do I think that the students from other parts of the world want to be in close proximity to Research Triangle? Absolutely. So I think there's a ton of potential there. It's just not, in my mind, um, it's not as high a priority for us right now um, because I think we have higher needs that, and frankly, I think we've got strategies that can bring about more dramatic improvement in our overall growth um, than putting all of our eggs in that basket. But I do think long term, it's something we want to consider as part of our growth portfolio. Oh, great. Okay. Now, I will say that we have been attracting students from other parts of the globe. Um, and so uh, no matter what, we need to make sure that those students who are choosing us um, are being served well, and, and we're identifying what those needs are. In general, I think they're managing those reasonably well, but we've got some more work to do there um, before we start really you know, going all in and trying to attract, um, being intentional about that recruitment strategy. Other questions? Anything else from social media? No? All right. Very good. Well, thank you all very, very much. It's been a pleasure to spend this afternoon with you. Have a good afternoon.